So as I mentioned in the podcast, um, what we planted May 9th through the 14th time frame is kind of what I'm calling the perfect storm. We got a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of fields that we visited uh, from beat up stands to nothing, uh, meaning that the areas where we had 100% kill with the, with the stand itself. And I wanna take some time to explain how this all took place because a lot of growers are confused. They had water standing on their April planted corn, in some cases 10 days, uh, water came off, the crops came up. And with this go around, uh, that ninth through the 14th, 15th timeframe, um, they have total loss of stand. And as they're digging in what's not been uh, completely wiped out, they're finding uh, <clears throat> a drop in ear count. And I wanna walk us through, there's two or three things that are in play here that we probably need to understand and know about. And the first is um, the issue of why did we have so much what we would call traditional seed chilling in this planting window? And I wanna walk you through that. And let's start with temperatures. These are temperatures that we're dealing with on May 9th, uh, the day of the freeze. And we're talking about two inch soil temperatures right where the seed is sitting. And remember seed chilling is gonna take place as the plant imbibes water as it imbibes water, the seed swells. And if that water that's coming into the soil or into the seed is 50 degrees or higher, there's elasticity in the seed cells and they'll tend to expand uh, and do what they're supposed to. But if that water is lower than 50 degrees, when they start to swell, there is not the elasticity in the cells and they'll shred. So we'll rip cells in that seed as it expands. And that's what we call seed chilling. Happens at 50 degrees, but definitely happens when we drop below that, especially below 45 degrees. So on May 9th, of course, we had adequate cold temperatures or minimum temperatures in the soil uh, to cause seed chilling. And we moved to May 10th, a lot of corn going in there, and our cold temperatures are in the mid 40s, depending on where you live. May 11th, uh, dipping back down again, 43, 44, even 37 in parts of the uh, state. May 12th, we even take a more dip. So at 41 degrees, seed chilling is gonna be, again, more pronounced. So we're stacking these days up. May 13th, we're still not above 50 degrees. It really is until noon on um, May 14th that we're probably out of that window. So corn planted around uh, the noon time are gonna have less seed chilling. Now this seed chilling again is gonna take place uh, on all seeds, whether it's in the low ground or the high ground. So we put that seed in the ground, it's gonna imbibe that water, it's gonna swell. And if everything goes okay, once it's swelled and it's warm enough, it'll germinate. As long as there's temperature and oxygen there, away we're off. In this case, these seeds swelled before the soil was warm enough, but also uh, with the soil water temperature down, causing the chilling. Now this is probably more what we're used to when we talk about seed chilling. The, the seed is disoriented. It'll circle itself and you'll see a uh, kind of a leafing out underground. Now that's different from a crust. We get a crust, you'll see the spike push on that crust and keep pushing until it blows open and then leaves out underground. This is plants that are leafing out right on at seed level. So a situation where they're disoriented, they don't know which way's up. That's probably what most farmers are used to looking at when we talk about seed chilling. But seed chilling also looks at different ways too. You'll see seed chilling where you'll have a root system that fires off and no spike, or you have a spike that fires off and no root system. So these are all classic seed chilling issues. And typically seed chilling is gonna to amount to 10, maybe 15% of the stand could be affected. It's gonna be all the stand, whether it was in the low ground, high ground or whatever, uh, would experience this seed chilling. Uh, working with growers as we're looking at these fields, they said, well, Ken, if I called in uh, on the 13th and told you I wanted to plant corn, would you have stopped me? Not necessarily. All we would have done, and we did, for a lot of you guys, we just made you aware of the risk. So if you hadn't had any corn planted, it's May 14th, May 13th, it's time to get something done about sticking some fields in, but be conscious of the fact that you could lose 10 to 15% of the stand due to seed chilling. If you're willing to take that risk, then go ahead. And based on how many acres we had to plant and what looked like we had to replant stuff, it still may have been the right decision. 
Now, I've got to tell you, looking at these fields, yeah, we're probably crowding the 15%, meaning the amount of stand that we lost uh, up on the higher ground, the better well-drained ground due to seed chilling. So it was significant, but it was predictable. And I want everybody to separate that between the stuff that was saturated and um, basically got cooked in the soil. And I'll, I'll show you how that works as well. So again, once we get beyond the seed chilling, um, we have a kind of a double whammy. And the double whammy, of course, is moisture. So a situation, depending on where you were, over a four or five day period, anywhere from as little as three inches to as high as some, some reports of seven inches. So kind of depending on what part of the state you're in and what we saw on the 16th, we started to see inch, inch and a half, we see another inch, inch and a half or more come through on the 17th, there was more on the 18th, 19th, another half inch on the 24th. So we have saturated soils. Saturated soils is a problem for oxygen. So the low-lying ground side hill seeps are saturated. Then the temperature swings. So we're looking at maximum temperatures at two inches under the soil. And by the 19th now, we're seeing some good 70 degree soils. So that means that we have soil enough to trigger germination, soil temperature high enough, trigger germination and growth to start if we have enough oxygen. Unfortunately, the saturated areas that just got pounded by the 16th, 17th, 18th rain uh, don't have the oxygen. So they have the temperature, but they don't have the oxygen. Now, the amount of oxygen needed is tied to the temperature. So as temperature goes up, respiration goes up of that seed. The faster it's respirating, the more oxygen it needs to stay alive the seed will respirate a lot higher at 60 degrees than it will at 45, which is one of the reasons why, again, we can have water standing on a field and survive it for 10 days with 45 degree soil temperatures because the seed's almost dormant. Respiration is slow and it doesn't need much oxygen. It can handle that. Well, on the 19th, we finally got warm temperatures. Things are finally taking off for this corn and we're moving in the right direction. If it wasn't saturated, it found enough oxygen and growth got off to a bang. May 20th, same way, we're pretty decent soil temperatures, uh, maximum soil temperatures, things are starting to move, and we're probably starting to push some corn out of the ground in the drier areas as well. Still probably nothing happening in the saturated areas because there's very little oxygen in those areas. But here's the double whammy that comes in. And then by the 23rd, we're starting to see temperatures at the two inch level up in this 80 to 90 degree range. And in a saturated soil without oxygen at 90 degree soil temperatures, you probably got about 24, maybe 48 hours in the outer end. And this corn's gonna be dead because at those temperatures, the respiration rate's gonna go way up and it takes a lot of oxygen to keep it alive. By May 24th, we had some 100 degree soil temperatures. So those 87, 88 degree days, of course, are really gonna change the temperature, that reflected temperature when it hits the soil. And right here, unfortunately, is what cooked a lot of corn for us. If it wasn't out of the ground, because of saturated areas, by the 24th, it was dead. So you're gonna dig down and find nothing but dead kernels in that case. So it's not seed chilling that killed it that 100% kill, that's a 10 or 15%. This would be a total annihilation, these temperatures hanging in there. So again, as we walk these fields, is what we're seeing where there's nothing emerged. Now this makes it easier, right, to go in there and dub it in because there, there is no other plants there to compete with. As you're trying to figure out should you replant a field or not, one is we gotta know how much of the field is totally wiped out. Uh, is that 50% or less, get to be 50% or more, you're gonna have to start negotiating whether or not that's gonna be the right thing to do or you should just tear it up and start over. One of the things you need to do is go out here and look at the best parts of the field and get a realistic stand count, estimated ear count, and calculate if we leave that compared to replanting the whole thing, what are those differences gonna be? We patched in a lot of fields, we tore up a lot of fields, depending on the amount and how good the stand was, in the remaining part of that field. Again, in the low ground, it was 100% kill most fields, but in the high ground, you add in seed chilling, you add in some insects, you add in some disease, and we got all kinds of different numbers of how good is the good ground in this situation. 
So I want to talk a little bit about how we do good stand evaluations and plug those into a calculator to make the right decision. So the important thing right now um, with everybody, with all the scouts out there doing this stand count is to get a realistic ear count compared to stand count. And that's something that uh, I'm going to be honest with you, it's, it's a lot tougher than we've seen in, in many years. And I, just a picture here of a, of a stand that was in earlier today. And while we can count all these plants, you realize that if they're one collar behind, they're going to be a half an ear. If they're two collars behind or more or more than one collar behind, uh, it's a zero. So we got a zero here. We got a zero here sitting amongst um, these big plants. And as you scatter through here, going down the road, this looks pretty good. But these plants are too small to be put into the ear count. And you see the gaps. That's going to be plants that are missing. So if I look at just this picture and I say, well, let's take the ones out that aren't going to put on an ear or relate to all the, uh, the empty spots out there, that's 25% of this stand is not going to produce an ear. And we need realistic numbers when we're dealing with ear counts and projected yield. Now, would we tear this stand up? Sure, we wouldn't. It's probably going to come in too strong to do that. But if we keep it, we have to remember what we're dealing with because driving down the road, you would not realize this stand is in that much trouble. And your farm manager and your landowners don't realize it either. So your expectations may be too high coming into the fall um, as far as what kind of bushels that we think are out there. So as the scouts are out there and they're looking through that, you're going to see a lot of variation. More of this in the April corn than the May corn, but it's in all of it that I've been in. Now, one of the things you want to figure out is what happened to these plants that are late emergers. And that's part of the scout's job is to figure out, is there something there that we might have been able to change and make that happen? One of the things, especially in the April corn that you're going to find, is your spike down plants are the more likely to be the ones that are late emerging. Spike up plants make it to the surface quicker uh, and get out. Now, they're both the same age if they germinated at the same time. But the fact that this one broke the surface and started the photosynthetic process, it's going to get more growth per GDU than this one that's still below the ground coming to the surface. And this is a zero. We can't count that. And one of the things that we worry about planting in 45 degree soils besides seed chilling is the fact that we lose the ears on our spike down plants. Now, if we go back to that uh, first week in April, April 7th time frame, we had soils warm enough to get the seeds swelled without seed chilling. Unfortunately, the soil temperatures crashed. So we had corn in the ground 25, 30, 40 days, some cases before it came out. Amazing where we were. And when we have corn in the ground 30 days before it emerges, the tendency then is to lose the ear on your spike down plants. And that can be an issue. So if it's all your spike down plants that you're losing the ear on, we know it's cold conditions. Cold conditions and it took too long to make that happen. Sometimes like in this picture, um, the rainfall washes in the furrow. So the seeding depth was the same, but when by the time these plants emerged, the soil had washed in on top of this one and it took it longer to get out. So planting depth, that'd be one of the things that you want to look at. But I want to show you then how to go out there and you're doing a realistic ear count. Again, if it's a collar behind, it's a half. If it's more than a collar, it's a zero on your ear count. Let's punch those into a calculator to help us estimate yield based on whether we would or wouldn't replant or what realistic yields can we expect uh, from this stand. So I want to work with, through with you a little bit on the spreadsheets that we have on the website that the guys have put together that can help you make these calculations. Calculations, they're, they're mainly for whether we replant or not, um, but also they can be maybe for giving us a more realistic uh, approach to yield. And start with just the PDF worksheet that you could print off, take to the field with you. Um, you're going to go out there and do your stand counts. And then you're going to be realistic of what you think your ear counts are. And remember, if it's uh, one collar, give it a half. If it's one collar behind the neighboring plant, give it a half an ear. If it's more than one collar, give it a zero. 
So you're going to get your stand count and your ear count. Uh, and then you're going to go back and figure out what is your bushels per ear. And this is where this chart differs from uh, a hail replant chart or even a university replant chart. And you're going to plug in what, how many bushel per ear can you get out of that? Now, remember, as your stand count goes up, your ears, bushels per ear goes down. And that's what this little chart here is about. So if you've got 34,000 plants out there, but you only have 20,000 ears, if, you, if you're in a very productive ground with a high APH, you're gonna be choosing between five and eight bushel per thousand. If you're in a lighter soil, you're gonna be between that four and that six. If you got 22,000 plants out there and 22,000 ears, now you have the ability to do a lot more flexing and you're gonna be in this seven to 10 bushel range and your higher yielding soil, six to nine and your lower. So how do you decide whether you should be in the seven side or the 10 side? Well, that's gonna be, again, what you know about your genetics. Um, your hybrid yearbook would come into play here. So if you're in a full flex hybrid and you've only got uh, 22,000 plants, 22,000 years, you'd go to the 10 bushel side. If you're full determinant, you'd go to the seven. If you're not sure, go right down the middle, go right down the middle. And you can plug these in and do the calculations of cost. And you could then, of course, you're gonna put in your original planting date so we can evaluate what the existing stand is, your potential replant date, what that's gonna be to help you make that calculation. Now, the guys have also set it up so you can do this in a calculator. So you can pull up the calculator on your iPad out in the field if you can get signal or bring those numbers in and do them uh, in, the, in the office when you come back in. But your termination cost, uh, for a lot of guys that are using 14, 15 bucks, depending on what it's gonna cost you to take that out. Replant cost, you know, you might be looking at $21. Here is where I would add in some dryer gas. So if you Maybe if you want to add in six bucks an acre for drying gas or whatever, you'd punch that in here. And then you put in the price of what you think this corn is worth. I'll put in 330, but I know a lot of you guys probably sold it for over four bucks. So you put the four bucks in there. Then crop insurance comes into that picture. As far as some of you guys have no replant insurance, some have paid up replant insurance. So you want to put that in there as well. Then we put in our original planting date. In this case, let's say we planted in the perfect storm. We planted on May 13th and we're thinking about tearing it up and uh, let's say it's going to be June 3rd when we put that in. The field has a 220 bushel APH, we put that in there, give it a name, we'll call this the, the home 80. So if you print this off and give it to a farm manager, you know which field it came from. And you're going to add an entry. And let's say we uh, got 22,000 stand count and we got 22,000 ear count. That puts us right down here in this bottom with the biggest ears and it's a full flex genetics. We're saying seven to 10 bushel is its flex capability. We'll put 10 bushel in there at the top end because it's a full flex. This gives us what our original yield potential is. If we leave it, we're gonna be in that 210 range. If we tear it up and replant it, we're only gonna be in the 188 bushel range. So in this case, net gain to replanting would be a $70 an acre loss and you're not gonna replant that. Let's say if we have 22,000 stand, and we got that 22,000 here, but it's a determinant. So we punch the seven in there because it's a full determinant uh, in a situation at seven bushel. We come across here, now the net gain is $100 to replanting this field. Because if we don't, the existing stands on are gonna produce 154. So we got the same stand count, uh, we got the same ear count, but just what is the horsepower within those hybrids? Again, here's where that yearbook comes in uh, and becomes part of it, or what you know about your hybrids flex genetics. Let's say where things are a little bit better. We got 29,000 out there. We got 17 ears, and I've seen a lot of that, uh, and we don't know what it is, so we're going to pick in the middle. So we're going to pick an eight bushel per thousand scenario. And here again at 17 years, eight bushel per thousand, there's $168 gain to replanting this corn on June 3rd. So even if we don't replant, what this can give you is some uh, perspective on what the original yield put component's gonna be, and you can add in what you think that hybrid flex is. We know hybrids can flex as much as 12 bushel per thousand, 
but they need to be picket fence dropped. But this tool, I think, gives you a quick, you can put it on your iPad out in the field and do some quick calculations and then do a uh, print screen and, and, and file that away so you know, you know, what you're actually looking at. So everybody has a realistic end goal. That's my worry about this year. Last year, we threw almost all of our corn in the five days in June, and we had perfect stands. So that gave us some yield punch that uh, we, we probably don't have this year, and I want everybody not to be surprised at the end. We also have a decision maker just like this for soybeans. So you can go in there and you can punch in your soybeans. Soybeans is a little bit different. If you get to uh, low a population that uh, you can't do the weed control, you need to go back and, and think about what you're gonna do. We talk about going in and thicken a bean stand up. When we thicken bean stands, it is only for weed control. Uh, traditionally, it's gonna be one to four bushel. You would take in a ding if you thicken a bean stand up, but you're gonna get the weed control. For corn, if you're gonna thicken a stand up, you got, let's say 10, 11,000 plants out there and you're gonna thicken it up, you are doing it only for weed control and you will go down. You can't get 12 bushel per thousand interseeding or interplanting into it. So as we typically say, if, if with corn, tear it out, start over. If you're interplanting into it, you're doing it mainly for weed control and you're willing to accept some of that yield loss out there. So hopefully this calculator would, would help you in, in, in making sure we're all realistic of what we're gonna do. And realize by the time most of you watch this, you've made up your mind whether you're replanting or not. I'm more concerned, are you accurately predicting what the 2020 yield can be in these fields where you're leaving um, the stand and not taking it out? Maybe a little update on uh, stands in general. Uh, of course, the, the one big hurdle we had was the freeze on the 9th. Then this is a picture of a bean at six o'clock that morning of the frost. And uh, you can see the, the frost on the leaves themselves. And at six o'clock, and then we get back at 1 p.m., you can tell that that, uh, that leaf, that unifoliate leaf was the most susceptible. These um, cotyledons and the hypocotyledon dairy arch, they're actually quite a bit more resilient in, in a free situation than this growth above here. Now the good news is this growth doesn't mean much if we can salvage the growing point here at the cotyledon. That's the only growing point we got left and that's the one that we have to rebuild that plant from. So here we are on May 9th, May 13th, there's still no evidence of new growth down here. So this plant is still green. The good news is they're producing photosynthesis and they're feeding this plant. But we still got to make sure that this node made it. So it did not be split it open. Sometimes you can tell, especially the day of the freeze, there'll be dark tissue down in here, which means that um, it didn't survive. And May 15th, some of these beans are starting to be pretty evident that they're not going to make it. And you see the growth out of some of these other beans tells you that they're on their way back. But here we are in another field of May 22nd. It was May 22nd before we had evidence of new growth pushing out of here. That's a lot longer than we'd anticipate. Normally within five days, instead of in this case, May 9th, May 22nd, that long a time period, that's usually we would see new growth before that. Um, but again, it comes back to GDUs and we just basically didn't have uh, hardly any GDUs to work with. So this plant uh, is still alive. You put this one in the live column. This is in the same field. So even though it's green, we're out here May 22nd, this is in the dead column. Was, uh, helping guys trying to figure out how much of the stand is dead. You can't count it just because it's green. So a situation where um, the stand counts are down. Now, most everybody's made their decisions on the frozen ground, uh, frozen beads. It's amazing how many of them survived and survived with a high enough stand that we could keep them. So you could put those into your uh, bean calculator and help you calculate. Um, but again, it's a scenario where uh, about 25% of the fields I looked at that were frozen uh, did have to have some or all replant due to the fact that uh, how cold it got. But that mainly in areas and topography related. Something else that we saw on the 22nd was the first cutworm. So these cutworm are, are starting to cut. Uh, these are some of the first cutworm that came in based on GDUs. The big catches of cutworm are now start feeding throughout the next three weeks. So scouts stay on top of this. Uh, 
you know, here we go. We, we've got fields that are in trouble already from ear count. We cannot give up any more. So those fields that are marginal, you decided not to replant them, but you're going to live with what you got. Stay on top of them. Make sure these little boogers don't give us any more trouble. They're pretty cheap, easy to take out if your um, traps have been heavy and you've got residue and you got an environment for them. Maybe time to, to take a little preventive maintenance as well if you're going back to post spray those uh, corn, but don't let the uh, black cutworm get in there and do a mess. Another thing that we're running into is wireworm. Wireworm at a high enough level, I think it needs to be worth mentioning. Now we're finding these from Northern Livingston County all the way to Sullivan uh, from the Indiana border over Taswell. So the, the number that we're finding is higher than I typically than I anticipate, and the size is very similar, meaning that I would call these medium, maybe medium to small. The adult um, wireworm is going to be twice as thick and a little bit longer, definitely darker. But remember, wireworm is in the soil for six years, so I'm guessing these are in that two and a half year range in age, um, and I don't know what happened two and a half years ago to have such a high survival rate or high um, you know, situation where high egg laying process to get this started, but uh, they're out there. So pay attention uh, as you're digging in some of these, when the wireworm attacks a seed, it'll go right through the center. So they're like a bullet hole, you'll see a hole right through the center of that seed uh, and out the other side. Once they pass through the seed, they'll circle back through the crown. And you're gonna start to see that in the next two weeks where the center of the plant start to die. The bottom leaves are alive, but the center of that plant starts to show stress. And that's most likely gonna be wireworm. And when you dig it up, that wireworm will go through the crown. Again, it's like in this picture, they're all about that size. So that's something I don't know how to explain, but that is um, what we're seeing out there. So we wanna stay on top of that. Uh, unfortunately, by the time wireworms take out more of the stand, there's no rescue. We can't go out here and rescue the wireworm. We just have to deal with those issues. But as you're digging out there and you tend to find more wireworm than you expect and your count is on the border where you, um, whether or not you uh, should replant, that might be a decision that would go in there because you're probably going to lose more. Now, Again, you've got to stay at the upper end of your seed treatments to get these, and they're going to have to eat some uh, before they, they're taken out. So um, when we talk about a seed treatment, if you go back into replant, make sure you're at the upper end of your insecticide treatment, uh, and maybe think about putting an insecticide in furrow. We talk about T-banding for rootworm. When it comes to wireworm, we need to be in furrow. So if I was finding wireworm and I planned on replanting, I would uh, I would make some adjustments uh, to make sure that we're not fighting. And the wireworm is not going to go away. It isn't like uh, it's June now, we're not going to deal with it. It's going to be there and taking out plants as long as the plants are susceptible to it. 